Hey, you found the Drummer Mindset Podcast. I'm Joel Pereer. Uh, I am releasing my episode with J.J. Bauer. J.J. is another Augusta drummer. Uh, grew up in my hometown. He was just a couple of years ahead of me. Our paths never really crossed. We were at different schools, um, but I definitely knew about him and heard about him from a lot of people uh, just on, on how good of a drummer he was and always had a reputation of being a nice guy. And uh, he was playing with different bands in Augusta, Riff Raff Kings, uh, foul mouth Mitchie, uh, and then he went on to play in Athens bands, Atlanta bands, LA, went on tour, uh, world tour. Uh, now he plays in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where he also roasts his own coffee, uh, instrumental coffee. There will be a link in the description. Um, and yeah, so I just, it was, um, while we didn't really know each other in Augusta, uh, they, you know, Augusta is kind of a tight knit community. So to hear him tell stories makes me all nostalgic. And it was really exciting to also create a playlist with him. He's got big ears and is really cool to kind of dive in and listen to a lot of, a lot of bands that I had never heard of, uh, that were maybe around the Athens Augusta area and other bands as well. And so, yeah, and he's got some great stories. He and his brother, Brandon, Brandon's another really good guitarist. And he's also in a project with Jason Neal, who is yet another amazing Augusta drummer. Um, and they play in a band together called Sky Dog, uh, Almond Brothers tribute band, and they often share the stage. So I think that one is worth the trip for me at some point to get up to Virginia and see that. But uh, anyway, uh, really nice guy. I hope you dig it. Please don't forget to rate and share with your friends, especially your drummer friends. And otherwise, enjoy. Yeah, JJ. So this is this is an unusual uh, episode for me because you're the first home homeboy, hometown boy that I've like touched base with. Though our paths didn't cross a whole lot when uh, when we were there. Uh, I guess is Brandon your younger brother? He is. Yeah. Okay. Two and a half years younger. Yeah. So I must be closer in age uh there but um but yeah i went to school with like jeremy carr who you played with mm -hmm. uh and then we were just talking about john carter i rode crew with um and so yeah and so that band riff raff kings was definitely you know i think that was on the on the radar in a big way in augusta heck yeah what i'm going to try to do is not make a lot of assumptions and and i want to try to make it for everyone to listen you know so yeah, totally. uh i'll try to act like i'm a non-augusta person but uh but i'm i'm I, i'm not gonna be able to hold on to that very long because i'm gonna kind of geek out a little bit uh yeah, we can get geek out on all i think we should yeah. i think this is this is for this is for the hometown but uh well tell me a little bit about your your history in drumming so well my my little brother brandon and i ever since we were little we we knew we kind of had an urge to be musicians we would make drums out of a long time ago domino's pizza delivered drinks in plastic cups with the lids on them so we would fill them up with different amounts of water and play on them uh -huh. pots and pans we would like make our own drum sets out of stuff and and we'd show our mom's friends like look at this and they'd be like oh that's great yeah but uh we and then mom took us to see david lee roth at the augusta civic center which was i learned later that when he left Van Halen, he wanted to put on the biggest rock show of all time. And so that was the first show we saw. So we were like, oh, my God, we we watch MTV all the time. So we knew we wanted to rock. But then um, in sixth grade, I uh, started going to Tut Middle School. My uh -huh. little brother actually got a drum set first. And uh, so we had problems sharing. So like six months later, I got my own kit. So he had a Tama Swing Star, uh -huh. which was awesome, from Jay's Music downtown and then i got a pearl international which i played for like 10 years well through like the first half of riff raff kings till i got like m my dream kid at the time uh, yeah but so what was your dream kid at the time it was the uh orange county drums and percussion like a, a custom ocdp kit with yeah vented snare and all that stuff because nice back um we were always playing in like punk and hardcore and rock bands that had no PA usually. So like we wanted to like hit, like be able to hear the snare drum and stuff. So like 
So everyone was playing cranked up loud snare drums and stuff like that. Absolutely. But in middle school, um, we just kind of, my brother and I were, were really gung ho about it. I hooked up with my friend, Brian Smith, um, who lived in national Hills, but he's, but he went to Evans high school and he's uh -huh. in the Georgia guitar quartet. He's still an amazing guitar player, but he and I and our childhood friend, James Will Evans, um, started a band called Criminal Justice, but it morphed uh -huh. into Mortisphere, and that's how we met like a lot of the local bands in Augusta. But we played a talent show in seventh grade, and we were already like shredding pretty good by then. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Do you remember some of the other bands that were kind of making it around that time? Oh yeah. Um, so when I was pretty young, like you had uh, Impulse Ride, okay, and and People Who Must. John Kemp was my drum teacher. Oh yeah. really? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, um, I got a I got a pretty sweet ride symbol. It's a, a ride combo kind of. It's an Avitas Zildjian that he got from, and just for the people again, Augusta. So we're gonna make a lot of Augusta <laughs> references. But Dave Larue taught him. Did you know Dave Larue from all oh, that yeah. jazz? Yeah, all that jazz. So Dave Larue taught John, who taught me, and Dave I think sold this drum set, this old Rogers kit, uh, to John. John like rewrapped it or repainted it, sold it to me. And this was like symbols included and in everything. But, uh, and then I started taking lessons from Dave LaRue once John Kemp graduated or left. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, so then, but I found out that that symbol Dave LaRue got from Alvin Jones at a, uh, at a clinic. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. That's so I awesome. still have it. It's on my kid's drum set now, you know, but it's still, it's still Man. serving. <laughs> yeah. That is cool. But yeah, people who must, I remember that. And I, when I got his drum set from him, I got a snare that also had like their set list written on the snare head, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, but anyway, so yeah. So you were, you were in middle school at the time, but people who must was big. Um, yeah. Our, so we had uh, three uncles that took us places where we, we shouldn't have gone. Sometimes they took us to the post office, this club on Washington road when I must've been in the sixth or seventh grade and my brother's in elementary school. And we saw, Impulse Ride, uh -huh. Chris Eddins on drums, and I remember, like he was, he was like an arena rock drummer, and we ended up playing together at a at Club La Vila in Panama City, like ten, fifteen years later with Riff Raff Kings. We ran into each other when he was with Velcro Pygmies, but um, he saw us staring at him. Gave I was the shy one. I was always up in the cut. My brother was in front of the stage, so he gave my brother the sticks, and he was like, "Hey, little dude, learn how to play drums." and and uh and inspired us and stuff nice and then not much later i sat in at the post office with the dead bolts uh -huh. which um chris hardy okay was a bass player and um who i ended up playing with later with um a few people with like craig holden and and like that but um that was like early early stuff back then yeah yeah nice nice so did your parents play my mom played a little acoustic guitar uh-huh um uh, they're from like a singing Irish family and my dad and my mom, they met playing basketball in, in college and um, my dad didn't play anything, but he was, I think my brother and I got some of the funk from him because um, he listened to like Commodores and Gap Band and a lot of good funky stuff. So he had yeah. an appreciation for music, but, uh, but he wasn't a musician. Got it. But drums were like drums were on the radio stereo or whatever at home. Yeah. Very musical yeah. house. Yeah. Nice. Well, and then, so you played in several bands from middle school to high school, and then you went off to UGA, right? When were you on drum line then, or I was so start at so I went to Westside High School in freshman year in marching band. Um, we went to band day in Athens, and I watched the drummers warm up, and like our marching band had two snares, um, one quad player and one tritom player because we had wow. these old drums. The snares were these old 15 inch Slingerland drums, but, uh, and three bass drums. But, um, we, the, our band director, Tom Smallwood, I, I believe went to UGA, but we went to band day and we watched the drum line warm up and it was like seeing David Lee Roth again. We were just like, holy crap, like the precision and the stick yeah. heights. And like, we were kind of like, we, we would always try to seek out talented people around us, but then like seeing all these people in precision was like a uh, mind blowing. So I was like, I wanted to do that one day. And, um, and then yeah, I marched bass drum for one year and, um, did Olympic band and, and, and stuff too. 
But by then I was like already kind of gung ho into playing drum set with bands and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, grade suffered. What and in hindsight, what I learned was probably a like going through a lot of depression and stuff. Mm. I um, moved back to Augusta and then started going to Augusta State after, um, I think, six months off. And okay. Stuff. And then reconnected with a lot of people and then kind of came back with a passion. I, I, like, absorbed so much from the drummers in Athens, like people like Dwayne Holloway and Richard Jones and a bunch of, uh, a bunch of amazing drummers. And yeah. uh, going out to see bands almost every night. And yeah. Like, and just wanting to be like close to the stage or absorb it or like sit in like I was super shy all the time but but for some reason like when it came to music I would like say like, hey can I be a be a part of this somehow you're there for it you're like yeah I'm participating but otherwise kind of in the background I, I, I identify you know as a drummer you know it's kind of the benefit you get a seat you get in the back y'all can be up front that's fine I'll hide back here and at the same time like what you're doing on the drums is not hiding. Like everything is out yeah. there. Yeah. It like they were, there were bands like Prozac and squat and the fat five. And then bands would come through touring to the Georgia theater. And that's when I got to see the meters or at nice. the time it was the funky meters. Um, and was, uh, was Zigaboo playing with them at that time? Yes. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, Zigaboo model east, mm-hmm. I think. Yep. Um but it took years to like learn to appreciate that more like as drummers you go through phases of trying to be heard and getting choptastic and really blazing and then and then like uh you strip all you start stripping away like um and playing what's needed over over time. But like I got really more into like like learning people's grooves and feels and almost being able to play in character and stuff like that. Yeah, I love that. You, you, and especially if you're talking about someone like Zig too, right? Like he's got a thing. He's got his persona. I mean, I don't know if it's any different than who he is in real life, but it's a dance. Like you and d- drums is a dance, right? So like, yes. And one of the things that I've talked about in the past or learned about from another guest was that uh, movement is sound. Absolutely, and like if if you can if you can move comfortably, you're you'll sound more comfortable and uh you'll get less fatigue and and if every if your physical and mental are fighting fighting against each other and stuff totally it's all like synergistic yeah and then too like if you're if you see your drummers and you watch them and then you start to kind of like take that on then you get a lot of that feel down too right definitely uh-huh. and it like um growing up like there was always a uh, like cover bands were taboo, but like moving, moving to Virginia and and start playing a bunch of original music with some people, and then playing cover stuff. Um, it's a chance to really like get into like different vibes and and get out of your comfort zone and and make it comfortable. Like when you you can kind of watch a different drummer and then or at least listen to them a bunch and see what you can learn from them and and try to try to be authentic with it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, add your own thing. Yeah, it's interesting. Like cover bands, kind of have been looked down upon, but it's uh, you know, and, and the tribute bands and stuff. But man, they can be so entertaining in the really? way that they yeah. study. I think so. I mean, I you know, like uh, just a little love to those guys that are those folks that that play in those bands, just because I think I remember like having like adopting a bias against them too at some point. Yeah. And, I was very um, you know, very punk rock, very like. Uh, I don't know, really stand up for, for music in that, that way and stuff. But, um, when it's done well, it's so fun. Uh, I'm playing right now in a Richmond based Allman Brothers okay. tribute band called Sky Dog. And one of the other drummers is Jason Neal from the Big Mighty. Nice, dude. Uh, yeah. There's another great drummer, Dusty Simmons. He's the brother of the band leader, Jeremy Simmons, the bass player. Um, Dusty's like a, a great drummer, but he, he tours a lot. So, um, instead of kind of shelving the band, we've, we've all, we've come to this like three headed drummer system where like some combination of us three will play together. And, um, like, like I, it's funny thing is I have yet to play with Dusty, uh, super looking forward to it. And we're, and like Jason, I've been talking about making that happen. But when Jason and I get together, it is crazy. 
Nice. It's like because we we both came up in Augusta, and then he ended up playing with my brother for you know fifteen years or so, and then um, yeah. But playing together with him is a trip. It is insane. Yeah. We're playing Saturday together. Awesome. Yeah. I, I hope you all have some kind of recording for that. I would love to see that. Jason is someone super nice guy. He's been in the Augusta. He was in the Augusta music scene in, in a big way. I think at pretty young age, and he was like a year, I think, behind me in, at Davidson Fine Arts, and uh, was a was a killing at that point. Like you, you could just tell, like his focus was there. Uh, for I, I remember him. He, I remember he marched snare at Richmond, and they all Richmond Academy is a school built in like the 1700s, but their right. snare drums were also 1970s, 15 inch marching snares. But uh, and then coming up playing shows at like the Capri Cinema or the Martinez right. Community Center. Like in Augusta, there was these great like like ecosystems where there was hardly any grown-ups around and you had all these great, you'd have national bands come through, but like always a place for local bands to play. And I saw him play in a band, Firing Squad, mm -hmm. um, with Chris, this guy, Chris Bonifay. Um, yeah, yeah. And then right... And then uh, soon after, and then he also played with Elliot Craig Holden, um, who's a great, I guess, a guitar player. But then, um, then started playing and touring with my brother and the Big Mighty. Um, they all moved up here to Virginia Beach a long time ago. Uh, he lives in Richmond now. He was in a band. Called and what Harley was the draw for you? Were already there too, right? So mm -hmm. tell me about that draw to Virginia. When, when Riff Raff Kings ended, I I joined another band based in Atlanta. Um, Caroline, which turned into Blue Flash and Light. Um, we had two siblings in the band from Akron, Ohio. We, we moved up there for a while. It, it, we lived there longer than we thought we would, but um, long story short, we moved back down to Athens because we were trying to think of a place to, to kind of uh, have a home base and record and, and tour and stuff. So we um, moved to Athens. That's where I met my wife, Louisa. Um, okay. after, after Blue Flashing Light ended, um, we were kind of thinking of what to do. So we, we ended up moving to Los Angeles for four years. Um, and while we were there, my brother and, and his wife were like starting a family and they had a nice thing going in Virginia. And I was, even though I was playing cool gigs in LA, I would always miss playing with him and like the frequency of him playing and, and, um, and his bass player, Levi, who's also Nick Pulaski from Augusta. So we would, we would visit and, um, I had visited before like over the years he had lived there and it seemed like a real cool place and um when we got to another another point like my wife she um went to usc to get her master's and we had another chance to kind of think about where we wanted to live and we visited virginia beach and and loved it we 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 came down here We're, we've been here about 10 years now nice nice i love that yeah yeah and i think jason went on to play with carbon leaf i think uh, and that wasn't too shows. long ago. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. And he, yeah, he, he a, a lot of session stuff. Um, mm -hmm. w there's a studio up here, Soul Haven, that that they kind of were a part of and helped build back in the day. Uh, it's still in operation. It's a killer studio, and and he and I both get to go in there and and track with uh, all kind of different artists, which is awesome. Nice. So it sounds like a lot of moves. And so I'm just, you know, kind of putting it together. And one thing that I, I talk about, and I probably should have said this a little earlier on, but the past 10 years I've been, you know, I'm a physician assistant and I've been working in psychiatry for the past 10 years. So what this is, is, is not therapy. And at the mm -hmm. same time, I kind of have that perspective. And so, t so t yeah. sometimes I talk about that stuff, but I never want to talk about anything you're not comfortable with. And no, so I'm totally, uh, I'm down. Okay. Yeah. And it's, it sounds like through, you know, you've had some, you know, some depression concerns, you know, it's a huge transition, like going off to college and stuff like that. But it sounds like drums have kind of stuck with you throughout all of this and has, have been a focus for you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It was like, um, it was, it was a way to kind of break the ice with people and like, you know, w help with my self-esteem for being mm -hmm. like, um, athletic, but like big kid and stuff mm -hmm. and um and and just having just having a way to express yourself and then finding like-minded people that maybe don't fit in all the way with mm -hmm. everybody and then um i always love that like having that bond with people yeah yeah 
Yeah, it's like a it's a direct line to that kind of bonding. Like you can't words can't really cover it, you know. And so, but if you play together, like that's that's a pure form of communication. I feel. Yeah, and yeah. like you said, with um, with with any stress or anxiety, depression, it's it's something that is learned in hindsight a lot of times. Like, mm-hmm. uh, oh, I was going through something, and you know, at the time that, you know, it was probably, you know, a big change and stuff, and and um, but I think now there's there's a lot more access, to, like for people to talk to. There's less taboo. There's lots of podcasts for for artists of all types to to talk about that kind of stuff. And yeah. um, and I I love I I talk about it freely with with everyone. Like um, just just being aware of your, your mental health and, and trying to address anything that, that could be an issue. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think that's one, it's brave to talk about because there's still a stigma in some cases, but I feel like the first thing to kind of, you know, to address in these situations is the shame. And so like, if you could talk about it more freely, like you're already kind of cutting down that shame for people and then people can actually identify and get more real about it, you know? Um, you know, so that's awesome. Like I said, I was chatting a little bit with the mutual friend, John Carter, uh, who you were in a band with Riff Raff Kings and you've done some, yeah, I'm sorry. What'd you say? Lived with for many years too. Oh, did you? Okay. In Augusta. Mm -hmm. Right on. Mm -hmm. He, uh, he wanted me to send his love. So I'm going to tell you that right now. He was very excited to hear about this and he just started gushing. It was, it was amazing. <laughs> like he just, he, I was like, Hey man, tell me about your experience, your, your relationship with JJ. And he's just like, Oh my gosh. And so, yeah. We have had so many memories. Like, um, we, we knew each other and, and in, in high school, I met him like I, my junior year, I went to a different high school and then came back to West side. Um, Where'd you go? Lived in junior a, year. We went to green County high school in Lake Oconee. Oh, okay. Around, in, in the middle of Georgia. My mom got a nursing job out there. Um, uh, but we ended up coming back for my senior year and that's when I, the band had kind of been dwindling the marching band. So I played football my senior year, Okay. Played, uh, offensive line. Okay. But still knowing like I'm auditioning for the drum line and, in, in college, like that's, that's what I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. But I met John and he was like a very athletic mm-hmm. kid. And he was like whipping me in basketball. And I was like, I was getting annoyed at him cause he was like being a smart ass. But then right. uh, <laughs> yeah. the first time I saw him perform, uh, like I had, I didn't go to this this group Young Life. I didn't go, but one time I went to this Young Life uh, get together, and he did a song called Cheese with two guys, where he was just singing about I love cheese. Um, <laughs> but like anyone can tell, you, he's like super super funny. Yeah. And then um, when when Foulmouth, the band that me and Jeremy were in, was like coming to an end, we all kind of. We were looking to do something a little more like hype and upbeat and loving and and just positive vibes and stuff. Yeah. Um, and we thought who would be a good good guy to get in there. And so we already we had um, Matt Morrison who um, came up and sang songs with Foulmouth too, and then him as two singers, and they really played off each other well. Yeah, John's oh, man, John, so I, John's a great ago. hype man, but also. Also has developed a lot of chops. I didn't realize his, uh, yes. his musical inclination when we used to row crew together. Um, but, uh, but clearly he's been working on it as I've been checking out, you know, a lot of the videos and stuff from Riff Raff Kings yeah. and what y'all, and y'all continue to work on stuff together, which is awesome. Or, I don't know how recent, but it seems like at least up until mm-hmm. a couple of years ago. Right. Yeah. There's always something, something cooking and we're always trying to do something and send tracks back nice. and forth. Uh, but he, like, he is, he's just a guy who, um, is naturally, like, he picks up stuff quick, and, um, right. he didn't even, he barely played any guitar when we started the band, and then, um, when, when Matt left the band a few years into it, um, he became a sole frontman and then started playing guitar, and there was, there were shows where he would play guitar, mm-hmm. and I knew when he moved to Florida, he was playing guitar, mm-hmm. um, in a real loud, heavy band, but now he's doing, like, singer-songwriter stuff, and, and doing that full-time, which I'm like, I mean, just like my brother Brandon, they these guys grind like nightly, and uh, it, it's incredible. That's it's awesome. A, it's a it's hard work, but it's a great way to make a living. And he's doing yeah. it. So. That's awesome. Yeah, and what he said too about you was your adaptability. That was one of the things that he really, um, you know, respects about you, and says. So tell me a little bit. Like, so you started off with the punk 
perspective, mm-hmm. right? And then kind of yeah. went into more kind of like soul, uh, kind of, I, I wouldn't say, I mean, Riff Raff Kings, they have the funk. How do you describe it? Like how did so like we were that... still like we wanted like to to be the hypest, just have like stage presence out of ten and uh-huh. just like but but we wanted to be like the tightest band in the world, like yeah. Like you know, we love bands like Helmet and three eleven and a lot of like loud bands back in the time and, and yeah. coming from drumline it was like it, it was funny because uh with Riff Raff I use a lot of the same techniques that the UGA drumline would do as far as like play eight measures play eight measures over and over and then all right next part but but we would hammer stuff out like like half of our repertoire in probably the first three weeks and a burst of creativity and stuff um but but that yeah it all came from just everybody like being on the same page and stuff and it was awesome it was a magical nice. moment like we a lot of talented folks jeremy Carr, super dragon. talented yeah yeah sorry wait, wait, i stepped on you there what are you saying oh, oh we're we've we've been chasing that that dragon ever since you know it's like right. we kind of knew it was special and like we've all done done great things but but that was like the that was like the the jam right there that was the band it is special like to find that you know especially when you're so young everyone was around the same age right and then it was all hometown folks and so you could i, I imagine y'all i mean y'all were tight and are and so y'all practiced a bunch we had a lot of time too. We we were mm-hmm. still like um we weren't in like uh like adult long term relationships and, mm-hmm. and we were in school and maybe had part time jobs, but um right when we started we rented a practice space on one eighteen ninth street, James Brown Boulevard. Uh-huh. And um we shared it with figure four, but it was oh, I, I think it was a hundred and twenty five dollars each band a month and okay. it had a non working toilet, but like you could play as loud as you want and we would just go there you know, we're talking like we're all about 21 or mm-hmm. 22, and we would just go down there and plug a drum machine in and play loud, or or, or have band practice. Like we would um, borrow Figure Four's PA. We go get their microphone to turn it on so we could sing and stuff. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh huh. But but there was nothing else we'd rather be doing, so we were pretty obsessed with it. And you know, nice. as you get older, like commitments and time, like it changes things. But you really don't know at the time, like how how good you have it with um everybody having the same like drive goals and and then having the time to put it all together. Yeah. It sounds like bonds that, you know, for a lifetime at that point, you playing music together that early when you've got that much time and, and all on the same page, like you said, what strikes me too, one of the, th- a lot of the bands you mentioned helmet 311, you know, massive influence on me too. I remember listening to meantime and like, just, that was one of those records that I, the first album that I took on and I was like obsessed with was Meantime and just trying to get hit all of John Stanier's, you know, uh, yeah. chops and everything and his feel. But then going to 311 and it just strikes me like all these drummers are like marching band drummers, you know? <laughs> and so where I went to school, we didn't have marching band. And I know our band director was really happy about it, but that's one thing. Yeah, it seems like it just like you were talking about that precision being all together, uh, really zeroing in on your rudiments and everything is such good training ground for the kit. Absolutely. It, it, but, uh, you know, Davidson, where you went to school, my my brother, older brother, Jimmy, teaches there now. Uh-huh. Um, Mr. Bauer, he, he was probably wasn't there yet when you were there. Um, mm-hmm. But I have I've had relationships with a lot of people from Davidson and. and Honestly, I would I would have loved to have gone, but at the time when I was little, I was just a big, you know, football and marching band fan and wanted like sure. that that kind of high school experience. But uh, like if I could go back, I'd definitely hit up Davidson. But sure, yeah, meeting people like uh, you know Jeremy Carr that mm-hmm. went there and then Noel Brown, um, Doug Barrett, gear, Gearbox guys, um, just a lot of uh, talented people. And it's one that it's it is like the best high school in Georgia. Like year after right. year. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel very fortunate to have been, been able to go there and very much found myself kind of middling, you know, as far as like trying out for the jazz band, but just to be surrounded by that amount of focus and talent and stuff like that, uh, you know, it's definitely been impactful for me. I wouldn't trade it, but if I could have gotten in with the, with the marching band, I think that would have been helpful. Uh, 
but you can always, you, that bus is never, you can only, you know, you can only be late for the bus and you can still hop on it, you know? Tell me about your experience with uh, battle tapes. Oh man, so uh, back in Augusta, you know, the same place we I got my first drum set from, Jay's Music, sorry, I'm stepping on a cable. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up working there, it was like a cool place to work as a, as a musician, you had, you only had a few places in town, but um, mm -hmm. working there was awesome. I, I worked there for like three years, six days a week. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, that's, I had met Josh Boardman before, like he, he eventually started working there, but um, Foul Mouth Mitchie played a show at Greenbrier High School. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know how, we were like, there was a bunch of adult bands. There's Foul Mouth and there's Pine and Diagnostic. Um, yeah. Solemn. And then, um, or like Fountainhead, maybe not Pine. And then uh, the Daltons, which was uh, Josh Borman's band, and uh, Dan Moxley, I believe, and uh, Mike Stokes, who's a great friend of many years. So um, they played, Josh's band, the Daltons, started playing Homebrew by 311. And I was like, what? And mm -hmm. um, for some reason, I was compelled to go up there and then like sing one of the verses. And that's how I first met him. I think I'd seen him before with a, 311 head on I was like this dude's cool mm -hmm, and uh mm -hmm. so we be we got a we became friends he was a Columbia County guy like lived out from from Augusta a little bit but um you know he would come hang at my house and then we started working at Jay's together and doing making funny songs on drum machines and making each other laugh and stuff mm -hmm. um he like uh I, I started moving moving different places. He moved out to uh, Arizona, went to Recording Academy, then was doing things in L.A. for years and years. And um, when my band in Athens, Blue Flash and Light, ended, my wife and I, now wife, we were just dating at the time, were thinking about where to move. Um, him and another one of my old roommates, Stephen Bannister, who uh, also worked at Jay's Music, they were out there playing together, and, and we made the big jump to move out there. And... Um, we, you know, we had a, a lockout rehearsal space in the valley. Um, I, you know, before my my now wife moved there, uh, it was long distance for a couple months. I I slept on Stevens' love seat. It was like a two two section love seat. I'm six six, so my I was gonna my, say you're oh, my legs like dangled over. Um, uh -huh. But um, and they got a job waiting tables at this place, Granville, where Josh's wife um, worked, and that's where I worked the whole. The, the whole time I was in LA, but we, um, we just started playing like all, all the beginner clubs, like this place, Molly Malone's, this place, a good hurt. Um, but eventually like through like a series of emails to the Viper room, um, we had re like rebranded as battle tapes and mm -hmm. like had a really good focus sound and like we wanted to do. So, um, Josh recorded like, like some of the new material we sent the Viper room was like, we're a local band. If you ever you know have a spot for us, we'd love to open up. If you have any slots, and then very quickly we started playing at Viper Room and became like a, almost like a house house band there, and got to play with a lot of cool bands. But it's weird because there, you know, everything's backlined. You're waiting outside, like the the side door. One band plays, curtain closes. All their their fans leave. We go we go in there, curtain opens, and you play. Um, and then you know we played like um, the satellite which was old space space land, but just kept growing and growing. And it was like su super, super awesome. Um, nice. Uh, you know, there was a lot of homesickness that came after, after a few years. And then um, just like there, there came a time where uh, I made a move and they're still, they're still functioning as a band and right. freaking awesome. Um, yeah. We ended up uh, moving out of our lockout and then started re rehearsing at Atwater Deluxe. Uh, which is right near the LA River, and it was where um, it, I guess it used to be called Hully Gully, but it was where Beastie Boys used to. It was right near where they would do their their recordings, but Hully Gully was like a place that had a lot of shows, and they may have rehearsed there for a little while. But it was a neat, neat little spot. Um, we got to meet a lot of cool bands that were kind of in the same spot as us, and but also okay. got to hang with some established bands and got to open for, you know, like got to play with helmet a few times which was a dream what? come true yeah um yeah it was it That's was amazing. sweet like we got to play some really really cool shows um sunset strip music festival um uh -huh. 
I mean, and we were like, um, you know, it was like an electro rock band. You know, we had backing tracks at night, but I'd be the one with the click pumping in my head at like a piercing, deafening volume. But, but we'd have um, synth tracks going. We'd have the lights going at the same time. And yeah, we we would like we would be pummeling as hard as we could. I mean, we were like trying to throw down like 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 a metal band would like uh, with ferocity. Um, That's awesome. You know, like with you know, almost like. Um, you know, like Queens of the Stone Agey kind of thing, but but mixed with like a more noir kind of sound and stuff. Okay, so it was it was very memorable. It was fun. A couple questions. One, the electronic piece, and I guess like clearly you had access to that at Jay's, but it sounds like you were playing on a drum machine for a long time. Is that right? Oh yeah. So we would mess with stuff there. Like the first time I had access to a multi track, my friend Marcus Barfield let me borrow a four track tape machine and me and john carter got a hold of this thing and like this drum machine i had on layaway for like six months the uh, boss dr202 dr groove uh-huh. and um i start i got really good at that and so we started making beats and songs and like l- laughing our ass laughing our ass off ha- having such a good time but like um back then we'd make a ton of beats like i loved like a uh, timberland and an outcast mm-hmm. and like um it was kind of a golden age of beat making i i haven't really programmed a bunch of stuff in the last 10 years hardly uh but but we would we would mess around with stuff at jay's you know the owners would go to lunch or something we would like we'd make whole songs and have every all the different guys in in the place uh sing on it um using the gear from from jay's and stuff uh yeah but we we loved it it was just another cool cool thing to do like samplers and beat machines and uh josh josh took off with it. he was really good um and he was like one of the um at the forefront of like computer recording in augusta because like we were we were at a time where like we we foul mouth recorded at the capri cinema in augusta on reel-to-reel tape but it was still kind of hard to like make a cd back then it was it was like a dream almost but uh but with but within a few years, like he was producing stuff at his home studio before he, he moved off to go to recording school. That was just like, damn, this sounds amazing. That's cool. The other thing that strikes me too, is that you were in this kind of electronic sonic type of experience of a band with battle tapes and y'all would open for a helmet. And then later John Stanier would establish battles. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I love, I love me some. You must have influenced him. Yeah, I like I know uh I I I know Josh like was into like um you know break beats and stuff and battle tapes to him were like the tapes that freestylers would put on to uh battle mm-hmm. each other. Um and you know we like before there was a couple names before that like Low Res Limited. Um mm-hmm. and then we had played together before we had all moved from Augusta in a band um me him Mike Stokes and and Dan Moxley and and some people called Prefontaine. Um, but it was, yeah, that was more melodic kind of stuff, like a Weezer um, influence, Matt, and like Matt Mahaffey self, and like okay. that kind of stuff he was really into. More melodic stuff, than, and uh, which kind of like Riff Raff started getting more into, like, like as we went along. Like we always kind of sang, but then did it more and more as time went on and stuff. Nice. So, well, let's, let's kind of speed up to today and like, what, like, where is drumming for you and, and what's up now? I'm at the ocean front. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, so it's funny, like, um, leaving, leaving LA and moving here was a big shock. Um, you go from, it's weird. You go from, we didn't do pay to play, but we wouldn't get paid hardly anything. And so you go from like, spending money to park and go play places in LA where you get clout and exposure, but you make right. nothing. Then I moved to Virginia and in the first maybe week or two of playing like four or five shows, I made more than I made in years in LA, but it's a very different, you know, it's like, um, it's playing, it's almost like barking for, for people that are just like, just eating like chicken right. and going like, what? Uh, right. Which I think it was good. It was like, um, it's an ego death and it's like, uh, and, and like, I, you know, I was getting in my forties and really just thinking like, um, 
what are my passions and like a and do I necessarily have to do my passion to totally like monetize it like do I keep trying to you know use it to subsidize um but I think now I've really over these years I've I've come to a great balance to where um I was managing a restaurant for years in Norfolk right next door to Virginia um and then through covid it, it just got it was always a stressful job and it got more and more stressful which led me to um I've always kind of I've roasted coffee as a hobby but uh 2 years ago I started a company called Instrumental Coffee so I left the restaurant industry I have a 900 square foot roastery that's where I am right now uh there's okay. a little 10 by 10 square foot room uh that uh it's a little office that me and my brother made a little jam room but I have a little spot I um I always love slamming coffee, so when I moved here, I, f I got a job at a coffee place while playing gigs. Um, but you know, we would play my brother and I and and Levi. We would play sometimes Wednesday through Saturday, and each gig would be three sets, so three one-hour sets. Sometimes on Saturdays we'd play three gigs, which would be like nine hours of playing uh, with breaks and stuff. But um, so oh, like we got. I actually my playing like got improved a lot and like really helped my feel but but um it'll burn you out so so i'm trying to how do you find that Sam? well it went from uh in la like it went from like playing as hard as you can like trying to destroy the crowd to um i remember the first time i was loading into a gig in virginia beach at a restaurant and i just rolled my hardware case in and like kind of slammed on the ground and everybody was like oh and my brother's like hey man be quiet dude I'm like what, and, and just learning how to uh, play to a room and play, play with feel and play quieter. But uh, but getting to a balance of uh, work life and actually like taking gigs that that uh, that you want to play and stuff and and really like um, I'm I'm pretty busy right now with uh, like I have an eight year old son and I'm actually one of his baseball coaches. So there's a lot of volunteering with that. So between that and um, and slinging coffee and stuff. Um, there's not as much time for gigs, but, uh, but now I can like, I can, uh, do like maybe two or three gigs a week, which is still a lot. And sometimes I won't have any gigs at all. And that's mm -hmm. great. I really, um, I, and there, and with COVID there was a long stretch of not playing, which really made me miss it and, and appreciate it more. And then when yeah. I started playing back again, any chance I get to create with people is a blessing. And I don't take it for granted where, you know, like, um, years like my my buddy patrick ferguson out of athens um he had a podcast called crash and ride which um talked with musicians and artists about de depression addiction and stuff like that oh, okay um, he's in the band five eight and um i was i was playing with the band at the time kind of um not complaining but just kind of sharing my frustrations and he was like you know when i was on tour we were always like it's going to be better tomorrow um, yeah but he was always full of great advice about like uh just taking a second and like making sure you you're where you want to be or making steps toward it but 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 all the while kind of being appreciative and stuff and that yeah. and and the gratefulness comes with age i think too yeah yeah awesome yeah, you, uh, it's funny just how like I, I was struck there just because of the nostalgia because five eight was the first band I ever saw at the Capri, and so the Capri, I think yeah, yeah I've got I might have the flyer like I might have played with my high school band a week or two before. I remember nice. my uncle Brian would go to Athens, Uncle Bobo, and he bring home he brought home Man or Astro Man record that had Space. That dust. was the second band I saw at the Capri, yeah, and um and then he brought a five eight album or ep where where this the singer mike like he was naked in it like on the back cover and i was like wow this is crazy <laughs> um yeah um and but yeah those there's those were like some bands for when, when i was younger then i was like wow this is this is cool stuff crash and ride is the name of that podcast yes and um i know he's uh he does a lot of drum tech stuff and uh -huh. and he also works for um a place in athens nucci space i believe he still uh -huh. does um and uh it's a great resource for the community um for music and um mental health physical yeah. health getting people uh, i think patterson hood is involved in that too oh, yeah. right yeah oh yeah that's awesome yeah that's so cool man yeah it's interesting but there's like yeah, I, I don't know if that's an active podcast but 
there's a ton okay. of ton of episodes with a lot of cool people and and people really get raw and and um and share so that really like and I know there's other podcasts out there but it it inspired me to be able to talk freely about what what I'm feeling or going through stuff like that yeah yeah so lately so obviously you know family's going you know you're you're an entrepreneur with your coffee business uh, but it sounds like you and your brother do y'all still get together and play pretty regularly we do um, he it's fine he has moved back and forth to Georgia a, f a few times he just moved back uh, like early this year maybe like late last year mm -hmm. um, so there was a long stretch where we didn't play together and while he was gone and then after COVID I started playing with a few different bands here um, a band called R&R &R. it's a father son mm -hmm. Rob and Robert Schweitzer and and my good friend Sean Parker on guitar and we um, we played a lot while my brother was in Georgia and then um, actually like a lot of my other gigs are th through the Jason Neal universe because uh, okay. like he's in a band called the Gold Sauce with some Virginia Beach and Richmond guys uh, okay Jeremy from Sky Dog is also in that band and Gold Sauce does strict strictly like uh, R&B and soul music like like funky crap man really good stuff um, so I like whenever Jason Jason will usually play all the Richmond gigs and then I'll play uh -huh. a lot of the Virginia Beach gigs um, okay because he Jason also he's he's got a he's got a day job uh, mm -hmm. but he still gets to play a lot like he is a crazy in demand drummer and we're both each other's heroes basically but um so we did, you, I'm sorry, did you say that you had played with jason or obviously not in the same bands but in augusta before you left or did you become aware of jason later we shared the stage i think like with okay. foulmouth mitchie and then okay. he they briefly were rehearsing in the in the 118 james brown boulevard practice space but it wasn't until we didn't get close until he started playing with my brother and he was mm -hmm. already with the big mighty and they were yeah i was they they were touring like crazy they'd be playing They're all over the southeast and uh i was like man that's awesome I'm, i want to be doing that yeah jason's always a nice guy i remember yeah coming up and it was like one of those things for me uh and i'm just gonna be honest about it but it was just like jealousy that would happen and you can't be angry at jason right like he's always focused but it was like he's just a year younger than me i think Mm -hmm. And then he would just like blow it out of the park, you know, as far as like playing was concerned. Um, but yeah, I don't know how he got to how he got to. We still haven't talked about that, but he just must have been hyper focused as well. It's, I think it was clear like he was like when he would play like he was into it, you know. Um, and so, yeah, he, like he, he had that he zeroed in for sure. And then also what you and Jeremy were doing as well. And I guess I became aware more of like foul mouth Mitchie and then later Riff Raff Kings. Cause I think that Riff Raff Kings might've happened after I left. It started in like, like Oh three. No, no, no. 98. Yeah. 98. Like that's a, yeah. That's yeah. the year I, I graduated high school. Okay. So that must've been it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, that was like, um, Riff Raff Kings was originally going to be like a parliament funkadelic collective of, okay a big circus of people uh, trading instruments and just, and then, uh, you know, it was going to be like this big, like horns and trombones and stuff. Cause Foulmouth mm -hmm. did a song called super train on our mm -hmm. CD, um, which like it eventually came out as a seven song EP, but um, all the stuff we recorded is on, um, is on Bandcamp under Foulmouth Augusta. There's a yeah. song called super train with this guy, Keith Gregory, who was already like a, like an older singer and um, okay. we did a funk song with horns and trombone and stuff so i remember a couple of the guys from davidson had gone over to a, a mutual friend's house i think where um yeah and tried out you know ska was the i guess the third was it third or fourth wave of ska was like big yes. during those yeah. times we wanted to like incorporate that but but the first time like like the the five of us played together uh it was so insane that it was like this is the lineup we started writing songs like like um we basically all knew each other but mike lamont the bass player grew up in atlanta and he played soccer for augusta state university and it was okay. only through matt morrison who played baseball at augusta state it was weird because we all had di the five of us had different demographics so we'd bring like a thousand people from from all these different like walks of life but uh he's like i know i know this this bass player i met and then we met him it was like bam 
like a nice. lot of a few of the first songs were just his bass riffs and mm -hmm. then uh or we just like make something up on the spot and like and it was it was awesome to answer your question about brandon i forgot to tell you um so he's back he's back in town we have this little 10 by 10 room which um i do like i have i, I did some built-ins i have some storage of some like old drums and stuff nice um and like i'll buy stuff at auction and like old marching band stuff but uh, -huh. uh we we soundproofed it a little bit and like he's got an old like a nice interface so we're gonna start live streaming in here like uh maybe monday nights with like like uh multicam and then have guest stars because we're like like he and i like have a, a special bond and he like he is funny as hell and um we do a lot of stuff off the cuff that's funny and like that's how we we kind of improvise a lot while we're playing like like song structure and stuff but yeah i think this would be it's in the planning phase but i think it'd just be a fun fun thing to do on like a on an off night in this little room and then yeah. jam people in this little room yeah and i remember too like he's got such great uh well clear chops like he can shred but then also like such great stage presence i just remember there was like maybe seeing him out at some of the bars uh in augusta when i would ever come back to visit or like at wedding parties and stuff and just like he was like the perfect mc like yeah you want to watch this guy and and listen to the music and stuff so that's awesome that y'all mm -hmm. are going to do that yeah we're, we're we're still playing um we're we're rehearsing in this little room tonight at 9 p.m. because that's when the Korean restaurant next door closes because they can hear everything okay. we do in here. Uh, but we are um, we're going to go do one song in the studio next week. Um, I think there's going to be video involved at this place in Virginia Beach called Flagship Studios. So um, we're getting together with a keyboard player and a bass player to do one of Brandon's songs. Uh, so we usually don't ever like rehearse. We're usually like always off the cuff, but we're going to we're going to get together tonight and and uh, tighten up some stuff. Nice. Nice. I'm looking forward to that. I hope you all, yeah, so Monday nights, that's the plan to live stream. I think it, it may yeah, maybe Tuesday. My my son's got baseball practice on Mondays, but uh Okay. But I I've, I've got a I've Dude, got When do you a, sleep, a man? When do you sleep? On honestly like playing less gig gigs help. Um mm -hmm. I so I have a coffee trailer now too where I have a coffee bar like 7 to 10 I'm in my shop's parking lot. Um, so I get up at five. Usually I try to go to bed before 10. Okay. Um, and on a gig night, I just, you know, stay, stay up a little later. I might take a nap, but really like sleep's important to me now, like for my, my health. So I really, I, I start counting backwards. Like, all right, when do I need to go to sleep? I have to get up now. And then if I do have, you know, usually one, one night of a little less sleep, is it too bad? You start stacking them. It, it can be, uh, it's rough. Yeah, man. Right. <laughs> yeah. So one thing that uh, John Carter also like made me privy to is the fact that uh, you and your family used to kill it trivia nights in Augusta. <laughs> My dad. Yeah. So yeah, I can't when, um, when I came back from Athens, I, I moved in with my dad and, um, and he and my, my older brother, Jimmy, and some of his friends would always go to TGI Fridays on Washington Road for trivia night. Uh -huh. And um, my dad was a big trivia buff, so we would start going, and we'd have our own. We we kind of have our own table because it was it was a place to hang out. I mean, back when we were like nineteen, twenty, twenty one, like yeah. of course we'd have a spare three hours to do like a long trivia night and stuff. But that was just yeah one of the fun things to do like on, early in the week in Augusta with Chuck Williams from. 95 rock that's right. <laughs> john said they closed down that because y'all y'all kept winning my dad did yeah uh -huh. it's funny my dad like we'll still talk um on the phone and like half the time it'll just be him reading me questions that 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 his team just got or that they didn't know and i guess he gave me like that uh like i know a lot of trivia like i i know a lot of stuff like random okay. stuff uh-huh that's <laughs> awesome John Cougar training camp. Ah, yeah. That's bad. Tell me about that. So, um, we've all in Augusta, you know, we had, um, the red belly band, um, which was a real popular band guys that are a little bit younger than me, um, that morphed into dead Confederate. And then, um, Patrick John Blanchard Walker, in that band. He was in the big mighty. He was in the big. It mighty. used to be, okay. it, it was kind of like, um, it was like people who must pet, and then Pat Blanchard 
started fronting people who must and then became Pat Blanchard, the big mighty. And then, then Pat stepped away from the road and Brandon, Brandon joined and just became the big mighty. Mm -hmm. But, uh, John Watkins was in that band. He went on to start playing with Red Belly. Red Belly turned into Dead Confederate, but I reconnect, reconnected with all those guys when I moved back to Athens in like 2006. Okay. Um, and I like was just super into the Athens music scene. I worked downtown at the taco stand. I used to love mm -hmm. going to see shows and I thought dead Confederate was like a badass band. I like really yeah. liked, liked their, their change and, and sound and stuff. So they would always be on the road. But, um, a little bit before I left town, uh, it was, I believe it was all Jason Scarborough's idea, the drummer of dead Confederate to put together this, like, I guess in their van, they always listen to a lot of sludge and stoner doom metal. Mm -hmm. So he made this playlist, these loud, loud songs, uh, Melvin's big business. Um, but all, all covers just like, um, real sludgy dead mm -hmm. meadow officer may, um, and his his vision was was this this big band with three drummers playing okay. at the same time. So it was me, him, and his brother Brandon Scarborough, who was in Gift Horse with them, a bunch of other Augusta guys that lived in uh, Athens. So John Cougar Training Camp, we we got together for a few rehearsals, um, and it was a one off at the Forty Watt, where um, we had three full drum sets. Jason in the middle. I'm like stage right. Brandon stage left. And then we have um, the guys from a bunch of different Athens bands come up like every song or every other song. So um, we had stuff like John Watkins plays. He's a keyboard player, never played bass on stage, but on a song he played bass. Okay. Um, but we did fun stuff like that. We did a Nirvana song. But, um, yeah, we put most of it up on, on YouTube. And um, we had Mark Malden, who was doing Lights for Dead Confederate, do Lights. And... Um, we had a uh, Noel Brown's band, The Cubist, open, and then a a cool uh, a band from Baltimore, The New Regime, I think they were called. That was awesome, but it was like a total just something to do to have fun, and yeah. uh, and it was cool because we were like all playing together in unison. And I've always like it's it's been I've always wanted to do something like that up here in Virginia, like maybe not if not exactly like that, some kind of mega band like that. Cause I was a huge, a huge fan of Dead Confederate, and then when I moved to L.A., they would come out there, and I'd see them a couple times. And then when when Jason eventually left the band, I I got to join them for a while, did and did a an album and a couple touring cycles, which was super cool. Cause it, mm -hmm. like growing up, I didn't do a lot of like van time, a lot of touring, and I was I was in my like early 30s, but like those guys were grizzled veterans after 15 years, and I was like, yeah, like. Oh man, it's awesome, and uh, and it was a lot of fun to like uh, play loud music with those guys. That's cool, man. Well, what what kind of music are you listening to these days? So I, funny, I do I put together playlists for for my for instrumental coffee on Spotify. So uh -huh. if you go to instrumental okay. coffee playlist, there's a few volumes. But I've always been kind of a a loud music guy. Mm -hmm. I I love. Um, I was always in, I was into thrash and stuff, but like. Mm -hmm. I I I'm big into funk and soul, but I love I love stoner music and doom music. Mm -hmm. I'm I've really been in this band, Rickshaw Billy's Burger Patrol out of Austin. Okay, um, they play eight string guitar. It uh -huh. actually inspired me to to buy a crappy eight string guitar right here. Nice. But it's um bands like them and Torch, which play um down tuned poppy music, like um with singing and stuff like uh. Okay. I love big business and I love like the Melvins and uh -huh. um, the last few albums from the armed are really cool uh -huh. um, okay. man. And, but I've always like, like learning songs for this band gold sauce really got me into the sixties funk and soul. Yeah. Um, There's that, like a real funk. resurgence of that. Yeah. I can't get off it the is... organ trios right now. Like for fun. Yeah. And stuff. Like that's kind of where, and then also kind of going back to the roots of like, Oh yeah, James Brown. I need to go back and dive in. You know, it's like we Always. grew up in Augusta. It was such a big deal. And uh, uh, yeah, I one of the cool things about working at Jay's Music was being able to set up sound system for James Brown's rehearsals. Yeah, and um, we already knew Eric Hargrove, um, awesome guy. Like we became friends with him and some of the other guys in his band. Mm -hmm. And like it, so I'd set up their back. Wait, line wait, was he was the drummer? 
he was one of them, him and this guy Mousy, but he joined sometimes in the sometime in the late nineties, maybe two thousands. And okay. then um and this and was around was wasn't thinking, there a guy Keith who played guitar? Keith Jenkins? Yes. Yeah. Keith yeah. So he yeah, he was the band leader. Uh -huh. Um but I'd be like setting up drums like Man, one day I want to play like I wanted it was like when I wanted to be in the drum line, I was like, I wanna I wanna be in James Brown, the Soul Generals. Yeah. Uh, one of the coolest things I ever saw when me and uh Doug Froman Maybe another guy from Jay's Music went to pick up all the gear from the Imperial Theater where they were rehearsing. Everybody was quiet on stage and everybody was kneeling. And we were like, what the hell's going on? Um, James Brown used to do the leaning microphone thing where it'd be on a round bass uh -huh. and, he'd ba and he'd balance it. Well, while they were rehearsing, he, he balances it and it freezes. I swear to God, it freezes like 45 degree angle. Uh -huh. And this was before we even arrived. He stops the band. He got everyone to pray around this microphone. Uh, <laughs> it's sitting there like on a round base like this. And, yeah. and and he got his driver to bring in a little American flag. He started singing, God bless America. But it was kind of magical. It was like, whole, like he got yeah. his microphone to freeze. And um, stuff like that was really cool. And one time uh, they would record their rehearsals on a tape deck that we'd supply. One time this, they forgot to take the tape out and i had a rehearsal like of him saying like i want to play hot pants burning pants uh i don't know where that tape is so if somebody has it i hope they they enjoyed it but uh <laughs> but that like yeah the soul stuff was like you talk about a tight band like that that was it right there for sure for sure yeah i wonder what those guys are up to these days that were in that <laughs> band you know eric is in uh asia maybe singapore i think or okay. taiwan but um he's lived in asia for a while playing playing a lot he played with bootsy collins for a while mm -hmm. um it's funny he came to visit us in virginia beach not long after i moved here maybe like seven eight years ago and we we jammed with my brother and Le levi pulaski at soul haven studios with with both of us playing drums and we were trading fours and stuff but it was like it was badass it was cool um but really, like, uh, I wish I could see more live music up here. It's not, it's not like always in the best routing and stuff. Um, but when I can, I, like Richmond's close, and right. I, I'll try to. And get they have a pretty good there. music. Uh, it's a pretty good music town, right? Yeah, I say that. Yeah, All I know of, about them is yeah. Guar, you know. So <laughs> I've seen them like eight times. They were my favorite. One yeah. time, I, I took my little brother. So I was in like eleventh grade, and Brandon was in eighth. We went to see Guar. Mm -hmm. at the uh at the masquerade no no it was at uh, lakewood amphitheater but inside okay. and uh this band x cops was part was war like dresses cops and then this atlanta band nihilist so my little brother in eighth grade the first opening band starts he runs in the pit 10 seconds later he comes out just blood streaming down his face he said somebody to punch him in the nose wow but we love yeah we just brandon used to listen to like all like all, all of my music and then but then he got into like dave matthews band and sure. uh, fish and then yeah. it was all over after that and then y'all you know <laughs> never talked again huh yeah not for not for no, a while yeah no <laughs> no we were always like uh we were inseparable we were sweet brothers to each other we nice. never really unless you had to fight over the drum kit that's right, right? that's yeah. why we had to get two of them that's right well man thanks so much for sharing there's a lot of great stories too about how you've made it work, you know, um, as far as working, yeah. you know, food service, being able to pivot, go into your own roasters, like very much, you know, you've got the, like the entrepreneurial side and the artistic side, and you've kind of figured out a way to kind of combine them too and kind of keep space for both of those nearby. Absolutely. And, and right now as like the business has been in the startup, I had been at synergy cause I'll, I'll, I'll like put my gig money into like building the company. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's always like, you always learn how to hustle. Like what, what, like, um, what can you do to, to live or like survive and stuff. And, uh, you know, I always had like a gung ho mentality, but I always needed to be employed and like have, you know, like have some stability. Yeah. So I feel like it, you know, like I, I didn't have anything to fall back on, but I was also like, I got to like, I have to work or I have to like, you know, maintain, you know, a certain standard of living and stuff.
Sure. The um, one thing that's that I've been learning a lot about lately, because I was never like I, you know, outside of college, like I didn't continue with drumming other than just kind of background hobby, uh, mm-hmm. amateur stuff. But it was always still a big part of my identity as far as like me doing that. Just one of my favorite things to do uh, is to both play and talk about music. But uh, but one of the things that I've I've kind of learned again recently as I've been trying to go to more shows locally and everything and just meet and network is that with musicians, it seems like it's just so easy compared to many of the other professions that I've seen or I've experienced as far as networking and meeting other folks. What do you, like, how has that gone for you? You know, in your entrepreneurship, networking's huge. Relationships are huge. Tell me a little bit about that. So I've always had like mild social anxiety and like, and even knowing I was talented and stuff, like I was always very shy and I, I felt like, even in Los Angeles, I felt like, can I approach, can I go talk to this person? Because I'm not, I'm not where I think I should be. Like, am I worthy to go network with this person? We're always worried about like, not my status, but like, I was, you know, it it really mess, mess up your head and stuff where, where you're like, you may be trying to put your self worth where it's like, where are you in your career and stuff? And, Mm -hmm. and, the older I've gotten, I've I've gotten more comfortable talking to people because I'm more, my identity isn't all tied into like how successful my drumming has mm. made me. You know, it's, it's, uh, because that'll, that'll lead you down a road of hell sometimes because there's ups and downs and stuff and there's periods of a lot of activity and then sometimes where it's very humbling and stuff. And, but I think just being appreciative of everything in the past, being humble, humble different times learn keep always learning new things like now i feel comfortable introducing myself as like as me it's like you know be the there's lots of parts of me um mm-hmm. not just like am i a successful drummer yeah uh, and then when i stopped worrying about that kind of stuff it made me more comfortable and and things the things you want start coming to you if you know when you're a um when you can exude like a, a calmness and stuff. And, and now like, I think back in the day, I, which may have been a little bit of ADD where I, I was kind of always on the go. Like I, I couldn't stop and really have conversations, but now I just like savor moments. And when I'm talking to people, I, you know, it's, 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 it's awesome to think of them as like, even if it as something, if they're doing something that you're doing, you can have a kinship or even if not, you're just looking at them as, a version of yourself or just another person um just having the being comfortable to be myself and not worry if i'm going to be received well all that kind of stuff it's it's been soup it's it's been a really good like past 10 years kind of coming into myself as an adult yeah and, and not feeling like i'm still because i've told people like starting this business it almost feels like i'm entering the workplace i'm like still trying to still trying to get established but then you kind of think about like it like everything you do you do have and you think man I've, like you know you are you're worthy to uh go talk to someone you're not going to be a, a burden on their time you're not going to annoy them like all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. i imagine if you were already kind of socially anxious moving out to la where it was a big part right like everyone's kind of vying for whatever they're creating like it's such a big part yeah. like and they're just climbing 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 and and so then so and because that's about the timeline right like you left la about 10 years ago and that's when you also said like closer to your brother again and then kind of getting out like starting to learn to 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 play the room read the room play the room as far as like bringing the noise all the time or not all the time but kind of like one of your goals in playing in the past and then you started kind of providing some kind of environment or ambiance do you feel like that was uh looking back on it now it sounds like i don't know like you kind of grew into it but also that that big adjustment kind of helped kind of tweak some of that did you have any like mentors or anyone that kind of helped you find that perspective too or do you feel like it was just time and maturity and the move or what oh man like um i always had like i guess in different times of life there was always people i looked up to um when i'm when we moved out to la like the guys are like my buddies from augusta we they were already kind of established and um and like they 
like they worked like there were some mentors out there like um josh when i moved there he was engineering for charlie clowther who was um he was a composer but he was also in nine inch nails so um we go to his house and and on his backyard facing the canyon is the keyboard from the fragile that Mm. that he swung around on a stand it's there like rusting in the sun it's pretty awesome (laughs) um him and um and then josh started working with wendy and lisa from prince and the revolution Oh, wow. um, at at Henson Studio, so he was their engineer full time, and that was awesome because uh, to be able to go to this studio, which was Henson, it used to be A and M Studios, and there's mm. this, it's just legendary stories in there, and and like they, uh, we eventually got to record in the B room, but um, Wendy and Lisa had this little spot up down a hallway filled with instruments, and I got to watch them, um, uh, scoring things for for uh, for picture. Mm-hmm. And um, and then just yeah, meeting other established people out there was was really cool. And not as far as like as mentorship, because honestly, like I was always waiting tables. I was working or mm-hmm. band practicing. And if I could go back, I'd you know I'd do more interpersonal relate. You know, like um, meeting people and networking because um, I feel more worthy of people's time now and stuff and yeah i just didn't want to impose back then but it, <clears throat> it it toughens you up and like la actually um it can really toughen you up it can build a a hard outer shell of cynicism and stuff and uh sure. it took many years of living in virginia to like melt away back to the um soft happy boy that i always was growing up and not be an antagonist you know um you know because with with bands or relationships ending uh you know like there is a time to act out wild out or be angry and stuff, but, uh, but it's just a natural progression. Yeah, absolutely. Man, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing these perspectives and stories, man. It's been a, it's been i I've been looking forward to it for a long time and, uh, yeah, it's been great. Thank you, Joel, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you wanting to talk. It was the first podcast I've ever done. So sweet. Oh, yeah, so that was J.J. Bauer. Uh, like I said, super nice guy, very open. I find it so inspiring when people just feel open to talking about their mental health, encouraging other people to do the same, uh, and really kind of tearing down those walls, releasing the shame to really start to dig in and and talk about things because, you know, I think we all know, like, that stuff doesn't go away on its own. Uh, unless you really kind of get it out. And so definitely want to, you know, if you can find friends that you can confide in, and sometimes even when you have friends that you feel like you can trust, it's still good to, you know, get a therapist sometimes or access a place like Nucci Space in Athens, Georgia, that was designed and, and created to help, especially musicians, but that are, you know, people that are dealing with mental health crisis. It can be hard to reach out initially, but definitely encourage everyone to do so so check out jj virginia beach whenever you can check out the playlist go to instrumental coffee you can order online i just ordered some uh, a couple days ago so i'm really looking forward to that coming in Uh, but otherwise uh yeah i hope you enjoy don't forget to leave me a review you know and a five-star review always helps but you know whatever it is you know constructive criticism is always welcome And then also don't forget to share with your friends and especially your drummer friends. But I've also, after talking to a lot of other musicians, a a lot of other musicians have been getting a lot of benefit out of it too. It doesn't have to just be drummers, you know, because I mean, we're all people for the most part, I think. Anyway, uh, take care and I'll see you for the next one.